Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. At that time, Christ will come, quote, in his glory, and before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Arms give to the poor blind man. May he, may the Lord give you happiness. God give you good health. Give to the blind. Please. I was born blind. For my parents' sins. What can I give you? When you give, take this and pray for us. May the Lord give you happiness. Help! I was born blind. Please, help for the poor blind man. Please. He does too well as a blind beggar. If he could see, no one would give him anything. Leave me alone. Don't touch me. Don't touch me, I say. Master, that man was born blind. He's accepted his life the way it is. Why then change it? He lives in darkness. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The Lord Jesus is introduced here as the light in verse 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is called the light. He Himself said He was the light. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows Me will not walk in darkness. That's the only way out of the darkness to follow Christ. There is no other way out of the darkness. There are no elevated spiritual masters. There are only people who follow Christ, and He alone leads out of the darkness. He is the light. The light shines in the darkness, verse 5 says. The darkness did not comprehend it. This universal spiritual blindness has no capacity to comprehend light. The true light came, the darkness didn't comprehend it. No, oh, don't leave my eyes alone. I don't want you to touch them. No, don't touch my eyes. No, oh, ah, you are hurting me. They're burning. What have you done to them? What have you put on them? Go and wash his eyes. Come on, let's take him to the uh, country. Come on. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, 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 what's happening? Uh, happen? uh, Come with us and see. Uh, the master has killed the blind man. Can he see? Uh, don't know yet. Give him a good walk. The master has killed the blind man. Can he see? Don't know yet. Give him a good walk. He hasn't touched water all his life. Give him a good one. <laughs> 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 I can see. 
I, I, I am not blind anymore. I, I can see you. And you. I, I, I can see brothers. Brothers. I'm not blind anymore. I can see everything. Now I know Stay what it means to see. It's a miracle. I tell you, it's a miracle. I can see the world. My eyes are open. Brothers, I can see. Brothers, I can see all of you. All of you. In the 19th chapter of Luke, we come across, I suppose, what you could call sovereign blindness. Jesus approached Jerusalem in verse 41, saw the city and wept over it. And He said, "'If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, if you only had known that I was here and the peace with God that I came to bring, but now they have been hidden from your eyes." Boy, that's the saddest of all aspects of blindness. When the blindness can't be remedied, it's now hidden. You had your moment. You had your opportunity. You had your time. You didn't respond. It's over. From now on, you can't see what you wouldn't see. Level you to the ground, your children within you, not leave one stone on another because you didn't recognize the time of your visitation. You didn't know who it was who visited you. You didn't embrace the light because you loved the darkness and judgment is going to come and you're going to die and your children are going to die and hundreds of thousands of Jews, of course, died in that horrendous Roman assault and they were all catapulted who did not see the light of Christ into hell, and hell is described in the Bible repeatedly as outer what? Darkness. Outer darkness. Make way! Make way there! The high priest is coming! Out of the way! Get back! <laughs> what have you got to say? What have you got to say about the man who healed you? He's a prophet. There is no John, doubt. What are you saying? He's a prophet. There is no John, doubt. What are you saying? He's a prophet. There is no doubt. What are you saying? What have you got to say about the man who healed you? He's a prophet. There is no doubt. What are you saying? You got your sight back from God, not from that man. He's a sinner. I, I don't know. I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. I only know one thing. I was blind. I was blind before. And now I can see. <laughs> From the very beginning, He is their enemy. He is the enemy of everything they teach, He is the enemy of everything they believe, and He is the enemy of everything they affirm. He is the enemy of the way they live their lives. They either repent and believe in Him or get rid of Him. And with few exceptions, the leaders of Israel have chosen the latter. I can see. I can see. Do you believe in the 
son of man. Who is he, master? That I may believe in him. You're seeing him. It is he that is speaking to you. I believe. They piled up to see his miracles. They were in awe of what he said, but there was general indifference to him as the Messiah. Why? Because of the relentless influence of the religious leaders of Israel. Make way! Make way there! Make way! The priest is coming! Out of the way! Clear the way! The priest is here! Arafuk is here! This lying cheat was never blind. What? We of the temple lying. know that he only pretended to be blind in order to earn his living. It's he's right! He's a liar! I've right. got a long time! He's never been blind! And what's your story? That you can give sight to the blind? I came into this world to give sight to those who cannot see. And to take away sight from those who can. What do you mean by that? that we who are righteous are blind. If you were blind, you would be without sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. That's true! Yes. This man walked through the devil! There came a man from, from God, sent by God, whose name was John, John the Baptist, the forerunner to Christ. He came as a witness to testify about the light. That is to say, the light came, and even before the light came, a prophet came to tell people the light was coming, and the world didn't know him. Came to his own, the Jews, those who were his own, didn't receive him. Therein is the darkness. Chapter 9 and verse 24, a second time they called the man who had been blind, and they knew he could see, and they said, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He's a sinner. He's demon-possessed. He's like a Samaritan. He's an outcast and a traitor. And that's what they said to the people. And anyone who followed him would be literally put out of the society of Israel. But the critics have a hard time dismissing this record because you would have to be convinced that if it's false, somebody put it in there and they wouldn't put it in there unless somehow it attributed to Christ something that made Him more than He really was. This is, appears to make Him less than He really is. So the critics have a hard time with this one, and it's in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, explicit, John, it refers to the baptism of Christ. And He comes to be baptized. That's a Greek construction infinitive with two devo denoting purpose. He came for that purpose to be baptized. This is frankly shocking because John's baptism is a baptism for sinners. If he had no sin, 
If he needed no confession, if he needed no repentance, if he needed no conversion, no transformation, why being baptized by John? People were confused about why John the Baptist would baptize Jesus because John's was a baptism of repentance. Repentance. It was embarrassing to some of the early Christians to think of the fact that Jesus might need to repent, that Jesus might have to confess some sins, that Jesus needed somehow to get His life right so He didn't fall under divine judgment. It's impossible that anybody would invent this, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy One, the Son of God, was baptized by a prophet with a baptism related to sin, repentance, confession, forgiveness. That's really hard to explain. John himself has been identified to us as John the Baptist. He is John the Baptist in verse 4, given that name, literally John the Baptizer, because what he is doing is so odd. Among the rituals and ceremonies of Judaism, there were no regular baptisms. There were certain ceremonial hand washings and feet washings, but there were no ceremonial, ritual baptisms, immersions into water as such. And that is why he's called the baptizer, because that will make him unique. That'll set him apart from all other people named John, because nobody did this. So he's doing something that is very, very rare and unique, and thus he is John the baptizer. So for John to do what he was doing was unique. But beyond that, for John to baptize Jesus was strange. It was even offensive. It was even embarrassing to believers, even after the early writing of the New Testament. Did John baptize because God required it? Yes. I just read you John 1, He who sent me to baptize in water said to me. He's referring to God. God had given him His message, and God had given him this symbolic responsibility. This is God's will. But why then would He be baptized? Why would He go down into the symbolic river of death and as if He needed to die to His old life and come out new? Some say, well, He was just um, going through an initiatory rite for priests. That's not supportable. I think the best thing to do is let Jesus talk for Himself, so let's go back to Matthew 3 and see what He said. Jesus answering said to Him, permit it at this time, permit it at this time. It is unusual, but it is necessary. Allow it now. This is a special time. Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. There's the reason right there. It is fitting for us, it is proper for us, it is necessary for us to fulfill all righteousness. When John heard that, it says, then he permitted him. What does this mean, to fulfill all righteousness? righteousness, to do everything that was righteous, to do absolutely everything that God required.
According to Luke 3.23, our Lord is about thirty years of age by this time. So John skips all the previous thirty years and begins his story with the public ministry of the Lord. Jesus literally makes His public appearance, first step out into public, out to be declared as the Messiah from the obscurity of thirty years. He arrives from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John for the purpose of being baptized by Him. John the Baptist was the greatest man who had ever lived. Therefore, he was the greatest servant of God who had ever lived, the greatest prophet who had ever lived. Did you get that? The greatest man who had ever lived. What was his clothing like? Camel's hair and a leather belt. What was his diet like? Locusts and wild honey, anything he could find. He saw himself at best as the last night star in a sky that had only one. He was the last prophet. There hadn't been a prophet in four hundred years. There were no other stars in the sky. Israel was in darkness, one star, and he faded out as the sun of righteousness arose. He sought to be hidden. His joy was in being hidden. It was to bring Christ in view that He lived and served. Think of it, the greatest man who had ever lived in the history of the world, the most privileged prophet, the most popular preacher in centuries, drawing massive crowds, the most powerful messenger bringing the greatest message the world had ever heard, the Messiah is here and here He stands, the ultimate preacher ever. John's treatment of Jesus is the very opposite of his treatment of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you back up into Matthew 3, 7, when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He said, You need to repent, and you need to repent with a genuine, honest repentance that manifests itself in the fruit of repentance, you snakes. And Jesus was in a very different category. 
He refused to baptize the Pharisees and the Sadducees because of their sin and impenitence. and Pharisees, hypocrites all, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You do not go in yourselves, nor do you let others enter. Blind guides, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. You bow before the letter of the law and violate the heart of the law. Justice. Mercy! Good faith! You are like whited sepulchres, all clean and fair without, but within, full of dead men's bones and all corruption. You see these stones, do you not? I tell you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Yours? is a house of desolation, the home of the lizard and the spider. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can any of you escape damnation? They have followed Jesus around with one goal in mind, not to find out more about His teaching, not to be more convinced about His They have followed Him for one reason, and that is to destroy Him. And now you despise the Holy One of Israel! You don't speak for the people of Israel! Listen to the teachings of our God! Remember the coming of What's going on? I don't like it. I'll take a look. Come on! Come on! He's not the Messiah! He's a false prophet! Stone him! He's a friend of the Romans! Kill him! Stone him! Stone him! Stone him! Stone him! Traitor! Traitor to Israel! Traitor! 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 He sighed. Here it's compound. He's sighing deeply. Stronger emotion over spiritual blindness than over physical suffering. It, it breaks his heart. That's why he wept when he entered Jerusalem. Luke 19, John 11, he wept at the grave of Lazarus when he saw the power of sin, impact of sin to produce pain. His grief is profound over this hard-hearted, obstinate unbelief in the face of massive evidence, massive signs. He laments his rejecter's willful ignorance, and he said this, it's a soliloquy really, speaking to himself, he, why does this generation seek for a sign? For what reason? What, what else could possibly be done? And he sees beyond the Pharisees, this generation. This Ganea, the people at this time, they were just like their ancestors, Deuteronomy 32, 20. They're indicted there, the Jews. They are a perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness. They were false shepherds. They were stewards who were failing to fulfill their duty. They were removed and they were replaced. So in spite of all that the Lord did, in spite of all that He said, in spite of this direct indictment which they understood, and in spite of Him pronouncing doom on them that they would be destroyed and their authority and power be taken away and given to someone else, 
they still hated Him. It didn't move them. And they were still bent on leading the nation to, to join them in the rejection. Mark is writing about God's great King, the new King who is coming, who will declare a new era for the world. Well, this is His coronation. By the time the Lord arrived for His baptism, John the Baptist had been preaching for about six months, as best we can discern. Moving up and down the Jordan Valley from the north to the south, baptizing all the people who were flooding out of Judea and Jerusalem to come to Him, He was preaching repentance and the confession of sin for heart cleansing symbolized in a baptism in order that people might escape the wrath that was to come upon Messiah's arrival and enter into the blessing of His kingdom. His message was a message of judgment, a message of wrath, fiery judgment, and He warned the people that they had to escape that judgment that Messiah would bring and enter into His kingdom, and the only way was to repent and confess their sins. And so He was preaching repentance and confession for about six months, calling people to prepare for the Messiah and to prepare to go into His kingdom and not be judged by Him.